Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and for the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, I wanted to recount the last few hours before Pickett's charge. Leslie Gordon, in 1998, wrote General George E. Pickett in Life and Legend, a wonderful book that provides a beautifully written account of Pickett, the last hours before the charge. Because I don't think I could do better justice than Gordon on this topic, I will read directly from the book, if you want to learn more about the life of Pickett, please pick up this work. It dissects the reality from the myth. Pickett could hardly contain his excitement. Corps Commander James Longstreet later remembered hearing that his friend Pickett had felt hurt at being left at Chambersburg while the balance of the army was expecting to enter battle. Any such feelings quickly vanished. Indeed, here, finally, was the climactic thrill of Chapultepec, combined with the important responsibility of the San Juan confrontation. It was a chance for Pickett to prove himself as a hero general and courageous man, perhaps even to win the war. Sally, his wife, would later claim that her husband's entire life had prepared him for this moment. She portrayed him as ready to do his duty, but cognizant of the blood and destruction the charge would produce. Her soldier on the morning of the battle was a man fighting a nonsense of pending doom. George, she claimed, once remarked to her that at Gettysburg there was not a man in his dear old division who did not know when he heard the order that in obeying it he was marching to death, yet every man of them should not advise General Pickett to make the charge. Alexander, unsure of Longstreet's intentions by such a statement, predicted that even if both artillery barrage and Pickett's charge succeeded, it can only be so at a very bloody cost. He suggested to Longstreet that if there were other options, he should carefully consider them. This shook Longstreet from his hesitation, and he quickly reasserted Lee's original plan. He ordered Alexander to begin the bombardment until the enemy appeared weakened or demoralized. When that moment arrives, Longstreet wrote, advise General Pickett and of course advance such artillery as you can use in aiding the attack. As Union cannon fire loudly answered the roaring guns of the Confederates, he continued to feel confident and sure of victory. At one point, Alexander went to see Pickett to feel his pulse, as it were, about the assault. Alexander later recorded he was in excellent spirits and sanguine of success. Around 1.30 p.m., it appeared that Union gunfire had measurably slackened. Alexander even spied Federals wheeling guns to the rear. He immediately dispatched to Pickett, if you are to advance at all, you must come at once, or we will not be able to support you as we ought. For a passing moment, Pickett's feelings of confidence left him, and the old uncertainties reappeared. Using precious time, he rode with Alexander's note to Longstreet. His friend and commander read the note without a word. Pickett scanned Longstreet's face, looking for signs of encouragement or reassurance. Seconds ticked by. Pickett asked, General, shall I advance? Longstreet could not speak. He nodded and turned his head as to avoid Pickett's eyes. Pickett stiffly straightened and saluted. I am going to move forward, sir. The veil of pride and cockiness returned. Pickett mounted his horse and rode toward his division. A few minutes later, another note came from Alexander. For God's sake, come quick, or we cannot support you. Ammunition nearly out. In retelling and embellishing the chain of events that led to the charge, Sally inserted herself into the narrative, merely by making herself her husband's official biographer. She put herself at the battlefront rather than at the home front, where women were traditionally relegated. In a published letter that Sally claims Pickett wrote, but she herself probably penned, there is a passage supposedly written a few days before the battle where George described his encounter with a defiant young girl in Pennsylvania. When the girl taunted his soldiers by wearing a U.S. flag as an apron, George, the sensitive and exemplary commander, bowed and saluted the flag, fearing lest some of his men might forget their manhood. His obedient troops followed suit. During the battle, when George received E.P. Alexander's frantic messages to advance, Sally maintained that George stopped to pencil her a brief letter of goodbye and God bless. She also answered the charges that her husband was drinking during the battle. When Brigadier General Cadmus Wilcox rode up to her soldier and offered him a drink, she alleged that George sternly refused, explaining, I promise the little girl who is waiting and praying for me down in Virginia that I will keep fresh upon my lips until we should meet again the breath of violets she gave me when we parted. 
Whatever my fate, Wilcox, I shall try to do my duty like a man, and I hope that, by that little girl's prayers, I shall today reach either glory or glory. In each of these instances, she rewrote the historical record to present George as the model male officer and lover. George had little time or inclination to make such dramatic declarations or romantic gestures. Instead, as soon as he consulted Longstreet, he quickly rode his horse along his lines, passing orders to each of his brigadiers. As the men fell into line, Pickett stood straight up on his horse, waved his cap, and strained his voice to address the division. He shouted to the men as much to himself, Up men, to your posts. Don't forget that you are from old Virginia. He then sang out, Forward! The command echoed through the ranks, passing from brigade to regiment to company commanders. Within moments, the division moved forward. It was approximately 3 p.m. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian